Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. We have a very densely packed video for you today, so you're going to want to stick with me till the end because some of the most important pieces of information are going to be towards the end of the video. And this is going to be stuff that you're not going to hear anywhere else. I guarantee it. Now, I want to say that yesterday we put out a story which was based on something which was put out by the Wall Street Journal, uh, Reuters, several other mainstream media outlets that uh, talked about a bunch of tanks in Finland that were supposedly heading towards the Russian border. This, of course, created uh, a bit of a small-scale panic amongst people in Finland, and so the Finnish Defense Ministry came out and said that, no, this is incorrect. Uh, these tanks were actually headed towards an exercise taking place in the western part of Finland. So we just want to keep it 100 on this channel. If we get something wrong because the mainstream gets it wrong, then we want to, you know, make sure that we keep everything straight. So uh, everything else in that video, however, was factually 100% correct. Now, I will say, though, we need to keep in mind that there are a large amount of military exercises, a lot more than normal, that are occurring right now. And military exercises are also a convenient way to make your population, to minimize panic and not give draft dodgers an opportunity to bounce. Because we all seen what happened in Ukraine. They said there wasn't going to be a war, there's not going to be a war. And then within, you know, 24 hours, there was a war. And now you can't leave the country if you're between the ages of 18 and 60. So, uh, as much as I, you know, I'm willing to uh, walk back that that story we published yesterday, uh, I will say that there's a suspicious amount of activity uh, right now, military-wise, and there's definitely, you know, a greater frequency. These are uh, much bigger in scope, and they're getting closer and closer to the Ukrainian front. So. Anyways, let's just jump right into this. We got a lot of emails from uh, viewers from around the world, and then we have some stories uh, nuclear war related. Okay, so let's just get right to it. Now, if you... Oh, let's just first talk about gas prices. So gas prices here shot up like 15 cents overnight. So now we have gas prices in Canada between the 2 to $3 range, depending on where you are. And uh, it's getting pretty insane. So that means... Two to three dollars, that's per liter. So in the US, that would be about seven to eight bucks uh, per gallon. So it's getting pretty intense and it's getting to the point where I want to put the tundra in the garage because it's just too painful to go to the gas pump nowadays. And I'm thinking of getting a smaller car just for commuting because it's, uh, it's, it's too painful. So that's projected to go up even more because the World Bank is saying that uh, energy prices are, are projected to increase another 50% this year that's oil and natural gas okay so it's not looking good now if you are a canadian you may have gotten a message on your phone in the last few days an emergency alert okay an emergency test now i got this a couple days ago and it's not completely out of the ordinary you know you get these once in a while where it's like a test and you know everybody's phone when you're in the shopping mall goes off at the same time and everyone thinks it's armageddon uh or if there's an amber alert or something like that like a missing person or a kidnapping uh those will go off and uh <clears throat> but this one was actually nationwide and i was alerted to this because uh i i was received an e i received an email uh, several emails actually from people out of my province who said that they got the same message so it it's interesting that they're doing a coordinated one now to me this just signals that all countries are stepping up their emergency preparedness planning um they're probably knocking the dust off a lot of these shelters and you know a, a lot of these manuals that they're going to use if it hits the fan and they just want to make sure all this stuff is going to work because I'm sure uh, a lot of these systems are crusty and uh, they got to knock the dust off them. So I, I received an email from somebody who, who uh, has been driving a transit bus and apparently this was broadcast on the transit buses as well. So it wasn't just on cell phones. So it's rather interesting to see if this is taking place not surprising at all though i want to share a resource with you guys let me just fix my mic here 
Okay, so I talked a couple months ago about potassium iodide pills and the shortage of potassium iodide pills. Now, apparently, there's a place in Canada that gives them away for free, and it's a government agency. Now, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, the CNSC, is a federal agency that monitors a safe operation of nuclear stations. They now require that all homes and businesses within 10 kilometers of a nuclear power station receive a supply of potassium iodide pills. These pills have been made available free of charge at select pharmacies, but now will be sent by mail due to increased safety standards. In the very unlikely event of a nuclear emergency and a release of radioactive iodine to the public, these pills will help prevent the development of thyroid cancer. So apparently this person went to this website, prepare to be safe.ca and had free potassium iodide pills sent to them government certified. So go figure, uh, even though the free market is completely devoid of those pills right now, the government still has a stockpile. So it's uh, best kept secret, I guess. Uh, let's just talk about a few of these emails that I've been getting from around the world. I live in eastern Kansas. Over our property is a routine flight path for military aircraft. Seeing military aircraft is nothing new. However, there has been a drastic increase in the air traffic. Upon checking the reported flight paths during these flights, there has been multiple instances where I could not locate these flights on any publicly available flight trackers. Recently, this peaked at three stealth bombers flying low and in formation. And this person provided a whole bunch of images of these stealth bombers flying around. Recently, this peaked at three stealth bombers flying low and in formation. These aircraft were once again not able to be located on flight radar attached to some of the photos, which I was able to take with the camera on my phone along with the general direction of travel. So that's just a drop in the bucket of how many emails I've been getting like that lately. Now, some of that stuff is just normal occurring exercises that are going to be occurring on an ongoing basis. But it does appear that there is an irregular amount of it. Okay that there's more than normal. Here's another email. Thank you for your updates. You mentioned all of this equipment being sent to Ukraine, including jet fighters and tanks. People must be trained in their use as you cannot simply jump in one and use it. So my question is, who is driving and flying these? For example, how many fighter pilots does Ukraine have? How many tank crews do they have? These vehicles require a trained crew to operate them. Are these already in use by NATO? Now, the thing is, this is why they were sending a lot of the Soviet era stuff from the uh, former Soviet countries because you know that that was the stuff that the Ukrainians were trained on so they were only trying to limit the amount of stuff that they they sent from you know NATO weapons because they weren't trained on that kind of stuff but now apparently uh, the US is actively training the Ukrainians to do a lot of that stuff and there's a story if I can find it here about that particular thing. Uh, the U.S. ramps up training of Ukrainian forces. According to the media, hundreds of Ukrainians are now being trained on artillery systems, drones, and radars. And so they're doing this out of the country, supposedly. Uh, there may be something going on in the country as well. Of course, they're not going to admit to that. Otherwise, that would possibly expedite World War III. But uh, yeah, they are training them how to use howitzers and among other things like that. So, tis what it is. Um, I guess the implication here, though, is with this email is that is there, you know, NATO mercenaries using these weapons or training Ukrainians within Ukraine? I don't know the answers to those questions. What else do we got here? Um... This one made me think a bit too. I thought long and hard on the price of diesel today. Then it occurred to me, a consumer the size of a large country is now stocking up and using large amounts of diesel in recent drills and preparation, filling all the tanks, diverting fuel from an already impaired supply. No wonder we are down uh, one third of the diesel stocks. It's an interesting observation. You know, I don't know exactly how much diesel the war machine is using right now. I mean, probably, it's probably putting a little dent in it uh, if you factor in all the military exercises and uh, it's not just the Russians and Ukrainians that are relying on this type of fuel 
to fuel their their systems. It's uh, the whole world right now who's getting ready for World War Three. So yeah, I mean, as you know, World War Three ramps up. Uh, you would think that you know the the price of diesel would skyrocket as well because that's what all the big machines run on, right? Now there may be. Uh, the only counterbalance to that would be the fact that the supply chain is a bit screwy and there's not as much stuff being transported, but it's hard to say. Um, <clears throat> this is a bit of a longer one, so I'm going to try to blitz through it here. Been an avid follower of yours for a while now, and I just wanted to let you know some info I received from some contacts of mine at the DHS, as well as some info related to banking from what I am seeing on the ground here, I live in the greater Washington, D.C. area. I am a bank manager for a very, very big bank. I'm not going to say which one. Uh, most of my customers are federal government employees, DOD, DHS, almost every single one, including the non-preppers. Uh, most of the DHS, DOD, are silent preppers in brackets are saying that we have a serious threat from Russia on our water supply. I've been talking to quite a few DHS employees in the cybersecurity sector, in particular who are telling me that the word at the Pentagon in the White House is 100 gallons of water and three months worth of food, bare minimum. In bold, as we will not be seeing government assistance on the ground for a potentially long period. Also, we are seeing an increased escalation of larger cash withdrawals taking place. I just heard today uh, had to order, I just today had to order an extra $100,000 to make up for an increase in cash withdrawals at my own branch, of which 75,000 is already spoken for and will be out the door tomorrow. In response to this, cash limits for many, if not most of our branches are being decreased in response to the ongoing conflict. And now a new procedure is in place for large cash withdrawals. Um, let's see if I can speed through the rest of this here. Assuming an SHTF event occurs, even if we return to some level of normalcy in the banking world, it will most likely take years and most of these checks won't be worth the paper they are written on as a state will be holding the money. And I can tell you from experience, good luck collecting on those funds even in normal times. I hope this information will help in some way in getting people more prepared from a financial aspect as well as impress upon people that unfortunately even three weeks worth of food and water may not be enough for what's coming. So some interesting information about uh, bank withdrawals. It appears that uh, banks and alternative methods of getting funds from the bank are, you know, there's going to be delays with that too. So plan ahead. Here's another email. I've been watching your channel for a while now, and I did see one scenario on the news that actually made a lot of sense, and I wanted to see what your take was. The general on the news was saying that there could be a scenario where Russia takes over eastern and southern Ukraine and annexes it, making it a special operation, a success, and stops there. Ukraine becomes a split-in-half nation, and the war ends there. Do you think this is a good possibility? Thanks for all the information you give. I know you don't like reporting bad news every day, but I look forward to your daily news updates, so thank you. <clears throat> yeah, um, the whole problem with that is that y Ukraine doesn't want to let that go, number one. They, they're, at least right now, uh, they've backpedaled on, I, I think it, when they were in the early phase of the peace talks, it sounded like they were willing to make some concessions on the breakaway republics, but certainly not the south, like Mariupol and... Uh, uh, whatever other places like Kyrgyzstan and the other uh, the nuclear power plant that the Russians are in control of down there, so uh, that the prospect of of either side just accepting that and being good with it is slim to none, in my personal opinion, because not only will Ukraine never accept it, Russia is not going to be able to sleep at night if Ukraine can just rearm itself and remilitarize with the full force of NATO in there. And, uh, you know, we've already seen what's happened during a war. I mean, Pelosi, uh, all these uh, pre prime ministers and presidents have been going there during a war. So imagine what would happen if a ceasefire was declared. I mean, they would be bringing in 
probably bringing in the nukes, uh, to be brutally honest. And uh, remember, before this whole thing started, that was one of the things Zelensky was hinting at, was getting nukes in the country, and that's uh, about the time when uh, Russia said uh, we're going to do a special military operation, right? So, no, I think the only way, and this is why this is such a quagmire, because Russia really has to take over the whole country in order to to be secure. And even then, and this is why this is a never-ending thing, you know, th- then you're just going to have outside forces constantly trying to, to mess with uh, uh, their newly annexed territory, right? So it's... Yeah, this is a messy, messy situation. It's a lot it's a lot messier than a lot of people realize. Like there's not many ways it ends peacefully, if any way at all. Um I think that this is this is gonna drag on for a long time and we're going to be at this heightened state of nuclear alert for a long, long time, and I believe that this is just the the entry point to all of that. <sighs> now as we've talked about on this channel before, we are closer than ever before to nuclear war. And we need to remind people of that every single day. This day today is the closest we've ever been to nuclear Armageddon. And tomorrow there's a good chance we're going to be even closer. And a lot of people will say, yeah, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But the problem with that was uh, immediately when that problem you know, occurred. There was, well, for starters, uh, we we probably didn't have the same amount of nukes that we have today. That's one thing. They weren't as uh, targeted, so you know we didn't have uh, as good of technology. But we also JFK and uh, I can't remember who the Russian as president was at the time but they were immediately starting to negotiate okay and right now we're seeing overt threats of nuclear annihilation not from the kremlin themselves but they're they're doing that in a roundabout way and russian state tv is making those direct threats so never before has there been direct threats like of nuclear attack by from one nation state to another until now and this is exactly the same as the cuban missile crisis we don't see it that way because we're not in russia this is russia's cuba basically and this is like russia trying to put uh, missiles in cuba and how we reacted and got in a fluff well now that same thing is happening in ukraine okay and that's why they're in such a fluff all right And that's why this is such a serious ordeal, because nobody is negotiating. In fact, people are playing this nuclear game of chicken right now. So that's not good. Now, just to give you some insight about this uh, approach to zero hour, as we call it, uh, NATO has doubled its forces in Eastern Europe. Strike teams can appear along the Russian-Belarusian border in a very short time. And NATO's east side is 1100 hundred kilometers closer to the Kremlin than the West German border in 1989. So, you know, I mean, you have uh, one of those countries. My brain isn't working that well, guys. I'm still kind of under the weather, as you could probably hear. But uh, you have Latvia, um, the Baltic states that border Russia are now NATO members. So they're essentially right up against uh, Russia and as well as Finland and Sweden that are going to be joining soon. Um, all the things point towards increased tensions in the region and, and increased risk of nuclear Armageddon. At the same time that United Kingdom, the United States, Germany, France have pledged military support to Finland even before the formal start of NATO membership if necessary 
The Stugart-based U.S. Special Operations Command in Europe is conducting the Trojan Footprint, an exercise that includes missions across southeastern Europe, the Baltic, and the Black Sea region. With more than 3,300 troops, the exercise is twice the size of last year's training event, making it the largest SOCEUR exercise to date. That's the Stugart based U.S. Special Operations Command exercise, the largest one to date. So just goes back to, you know, all those exercises that we're seeing, they're abnormally large, okay? And when you have a war like this in Europe, in the heart of Europe, with one of the biggest countries in Europe, then, uh, yeah, we're closer than ever before. Now, this one is interesting. Green light in limited nuclear attack. So for the first time in its recent history, Russia has announced that it has simulated nuclear attacks against EU and NATO countries. All indications are that Russia's political and military leadership has decided to go further in Ukraine, risking the application of the escalate to de-escalate doctrine. The whole idea of this doctrine is very similar to the Hiroshima, the context in which the Hiroshima bomb was used. So you use a nuke with the hopes that the enemy is just going to say, okay, we give up, you know, we, we don't want this to escalate into nuclear Armageddon. So everybody stop now, everybody put your guns down with the hopes that it would prompt a ceasefire. And this is a, a strategic doctrine of the Russian government. Okay. According to a statement by the Russian defense ministry, um, Russia has launched electronic electronic simulations of Iskander mobile ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads near the Russian border with EU members Lithuania and Poland. Russian forces have exercised single and multiple strikes against targets such as missile systems, airports, defense infrastructure, military equipment and command posts, the statements said. So they've simulated uh, all of this stuff. And of course, they've been blabbing about this on state TV, right? They've been showing like, um, like the, all of UK incinerated in a sea of fire, that sort of thing. Talking about uh, using the Poseidon nukes to generate large scale tsunamis with 1600 foot waves that would completely wipe out um, the UK. The big difference is that now uh, Moscow has included the limited use of nuclear weapons. Okay, actually, I got to go back a second. So there are. Okay, so there's four types of armed conflict that Russia identifies. Okay, there's very small scale intensity conflicts like the Chechen conflict. Then there's localized conflicts like as the Georgia campaign. Then there's regional conflicts, which uh, include an operation like Ukraine. So kind of like on a statewide scale, if you're in the United States. And then there's global. Okay. Now, the big difference is that Moscow has now included the limited use of nuclear weapons, not only in the fourth, in the global war, but also in the third level of conflict. Its aim is to force the adversary to stop hostilities that have already begun with the threat of further nuclear escalation. If Russia does not formally declare war on Ukraine in order to have a legal basis for the use of nuclear weapons, because Russia, you know, with their own parliamentary process or whatever, they need to legally be at war with a country to drop a nuke on them, I guess. <laughs> you know, you'd think it, it sounds kind of silly to say that, you know, you need a law to do such a thing, but there's still laws, right? <clears throat> um, yeah, so if Russia does not formally declare war on Ukraine in order to have a legal basis for the use of nuclear weapons, then there is only one option left, and that is to strike NATO weapons convoy first, and in the case of a counterattack, use nuclear weapons so yeah there it is uh, we are definitely on the brink guys world bank says energy prices will soar over 50 percent this year in the largest commodity shock since the 1970s 
Despite a recent drop in the price of oil from highs over $139 per barrel, per barrel in March, global energy prices are expected to rise an incredible 50% more this year. Insane. I'm definitely parking the Tundra in the garage for a long, long time. I don't care how cool it looks or how well it functions. I'm just going to have to stay off the back roads. Yeah, and of course, with that is going to come uh, much higher costs of goods and uh, food because, of course, to truck it all to places, to grow it, you know, to get it in the bins, etc. Uh, falling inventories could stifle U.S. plans to help Europe replace Russian oil. So dipping into your strategic reserves to help out the rest of the world might not be a good idea in the long term. So they're saying that if U.S. exporters are dipping into the reserves to send enough oil to Europe, this means that U.S. oil production is not rising fast enough, a fact that the Biden administration has lamented for some time. And uh, ultimately, ultimately, eventually, this is going to backfire because Russia are the biggest supplier of oil to Europe. They're these two right here, okay? And uh, United States is this little guy right here. So the United States is dipping into its reserves to feed all of Europe, with, which has a population which I'm pretty sure is twice the size of the United States if you take all of Europe. Uh, so, I mean, do the math. It's not going to last forever. So we need to be mindful of the fact that they need to minimize panic, right? They're in crowd control mode. They're doing damage control. And from here on in, when I hear about an exercise, a military exercise happening, I'm very suspicious because that's a great convenient cover for we're getting ready to fight a war, but we don't want to panic you. Oh, don't worry. It's just an exercise. Oh, don't worry. We'll be able to make up for the, the shortfall in Russian oil and natural gas with this liquefied stuff that we're going to ship over or whatever the case might be. It's all crowd control at this point. So I don't believe a word of it, um, which is not to say that I don't, you know, I don't look at it, give it an honest look. This doesn't mean that I completely shun the mainstream media because obviously, you know, there's going to be generic pieces of information that are obviously true but we need to just be skeptical of stuff right now because that is that is part of the game right now uh, propaganda nowadays is so sophisticated and most people think that propaganda is only something used by the other side that's where our western centric brain doesn't understand it we we cannot conceptualize how people on the other side of the world view things entirely differently you know there was that old optical illusion that image with one guy looking at it one way and another guy looking at it another way one guy says i see three lines and the other guy says i see two we think that our worldview is the truth and that our worldview is um you know uh just yeah just just the more truthful option but you know we haven't we haven't been raised in a different culture and other countries like russia china have a completely different way of seeing the world and i'm not saying that theirs is true and ours is not true i'm just saying that uh we need to understand that you know it's it, there's kind of a postmodernist aspect to this anyways guys i'm just rambling on i'm losing my voice we're going to be right as rain in the next couple of days. we got a lot of great content coming out for you. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching, guys. Stay safe. Canadian Prepper out.